Hello, good morning. Uh, welcome to this week's Learn with Lorna, the 67th in the series, which is um, quite extraordinary. Every week that I announce what number we're on, I still I find it more and more uh, extraordinary that we're that we're uh, carrying on. We're still here uh, into the 60s uh, of episodes. Hi Fiona, nice to see you. Hi Penny, Mike. So. Uh, certainly the three names I've said hello to will know, but if anyone is joining us for the first time, my name is Lorna Steele. I'm the Community Engagement Officer with the Highland Archive Service. And this is a series of films um, that we've run every week since the beginning of lockdown March 2020 uh, to talk about subjects that are connected to the Highlands and share information from our collections uh, with uh, people across the world, as you'll see from the places coming up. Um, if you're watching for the first time, do say hello, you'll get a massive welcome because people always do when they join for the first time. Um, but it's lovely to have uh, everyone with us. Uh, as I mentioned, I work for the Highland Archive Service. We have four archive centres across the Highlands of Scotland. One in Inverness, the Highland Archive and Registration Centre. Nucleus, the Nuclear and Case Ness Archives in Wick. Loch Aber Archive Centre in Fort William and Sky and Loch Alsh Archive Centre in Portree. And the four of those together make up the Highland Archive Service. Before I go into this week's uh, subject, a reminder that this series is brought to you by High Life Highland at no cost to the viewer. High Life Highland is a charity registered in Scotland and there's no payment or subscription required to take part in this series of events. Um, but as I say every week, if you're able to donate towards our work, then we're very, very grateful for that. And thank you so much to those of you who've done it. If you would like to do so, there's a link to be able to in the comments, whether you're watching live on Facebook or whether you subsequently watch on YouTube, there's a link uh, there to be able to do that. And it is genuinely appreciated by me and by all the team. So thank you for that. So this week, we're carrying on uh, our theme of sport and leisure, but we're moving indoors from the hills that we were on uh, last week and moving indoors to uh, cinemas and theatres. Thank you. I wanted to say thank you to D John Drake uh, for his comment last week. I don't know if anyone else saw that, um, but John Drake had w uh, had waited to watch last week's film about climbing and mountain uh, mountains and hill walking until he was at the summit of Marsco uh, in Sky. So that was uh, that was a great message to get. Thank you for that. And yes, Stuart, the bull is back. And do you know why the bull is back? Because you requested it. <laughs> OK, so this week we are looking at cinemas, theatres, live entertainment as well. So obviously the Highlands has a long connection to music, dance and live performance. We do Scottish country dancing at schools, we dance at weddings, um, we have traditional music and dancing at Cayleys and so on. And as well as uh, the connection that the Highlands has had to music and dance as part of um, a work environment. So things like the walking songs where um, traditionally it would be the women, traditionally in Gaelic, um, singing while they work the cloth against a table to soften uh, the fabric. Or the songs of the herring girls that we spoke about before and when we looked at Caithness Harbours. Um, so there's been a long connection within the Highlands to the importance of, of entertainment, dances and Cayleys, often being created by the community for the community. And Cayley's particularly being uh, a place of um, social gathering, so a place to share news, so stories, song and dance, to uh, meet with family, to um, start romances, things like that. One thing to note um, as well is that within the Highlands and Islands, entertainment has always been um, within the confines of what was expected within the church. And that is relevant right throughout this story, right up until the, the recent um the recent past for most areas, but still the present for others. Um, and so village halls and, and similar venues like that were for many years were the centres of local entertainment. Temperance societies, which we've spoken about before in past weeks, it would encourage dam drama groups and dances and so on. Anything that would stop people drinking and do something uh, uh, innocent like that. Um, local dances and often town halls were venues for travelling bands and performances as well. We hold letters within our collections that talk about this, uh, talk about visiting entertainment, musical performances uh, and so on. For the upper classes, one of the things that really changed um, in terms of entertainment was the establishment of the Northern Meeting from 1788 onwards. And the Northern Meeting um, was really a focus for entertainment and spectacle and it was formed with the exact express purpose of cheering up 
and enlivening the north of Scotland following the devastation of the Battle of Culloden. And so 13 gentlemen from across the political divide of the Jacobite Risings met to establish an annual gathering for the express purpose of pleasure and innocent amusement with horse racing, horse racing dances and other entertainment. Um, the Northern Meeting continues to the present day and, and continues to um, engage with, uh, with entertainment and with the promotion of traditional music as well. And we hold the collections of the Northern Meeting and they are absolutely fabulous archive um, collections. But of course, the Northern Meeting was not a place that the whole population was able um, to go uh, to go to. So where could they go? So music halls and variety performances um, developed across Britain in the 1840s and 50s. And kind of a little bit, it sounds a little bit like a, our image of modern karaoke, a pub sing along with someone singing the main part and everybody joining in the chorus. Um, and in the 1850s, we started to see purpose built music halls being built, initially in the larger population centres, uh, such as Glasgow. And we have this image, I think, correct me if, you're, if I'm wrong, but this is the image that I always have of a music hall as a kind of rowdy, uh, body place, body word I don't use in context, anything except music halls, um, with drinking and so on. But what I wanted to do was read an extract uh, to you from the Scottish Theatre Archive. The Scottish Theatre Archive is held at the University of Glasgow and they talk about the, the in their summary on their website, of the variety of music hall performances um, that were being held. And so I wanted to read this to you rather than me trying to put it into my own words. So this is from um, the Scottish Theatre Archive website. Music hall first developed in pubs and singing saloon, saloons across Britain in the 1840s and 50s. Its immediate precursor was what were called free and easies, informal sessions held in rooms above pubs, hosted by a paid chairman, at which customers took turns singing songs with everybody joining in the choruses. By the early 1850s, the first expanded pub music halls were emerging in Glasgow, Shearer's Whitebait concert, hall, concert rooms in St Enoch's Wynd and Davy Brown's Royal Music Hall in Dunlop Street, where one visitor found that the smoke was so dense that you couldn't see the stage until the clouds had rolled over. Within the decade, audience demand was such that newer and larger purpose-built music halls were opening. But although music hall was a wider British phenomenon, it was also everywhere local and regional in character, responsive to the preferences and tastes of local audiences, traditional Scots songs and music, the knockabout humour of the geggy theatres, comic scenes and characters from national drama, and favourite songs and poetry of Robert Burns. Reflecting this, early Scottish music hall stars came from a variety of backgrounds, some emerging from free and easies, while others had been actors in pantomime or national drama, or, like James Lumsden and James Houston, were concert singers and recitalists who performed songs, sketches and readings. By the 1870s, no evening's programme was considered complete without a Scots comic. The Scots comics of the 1880s, such as Harry Lynn, N.C. Bostock, J.C. MacDonald, R.C. McGill and W.F. Frame, belonged to the urban world of the working class music hall performing comic songs and character-based sketches in the urban Scots of their audiences. From the 1900s onwards, the term became increasingly identified with the pocky, kilted personas made famous by Harry Lauder, whose tartan performances and best-selling rec recordings proved enormously successful with audiences across North America, Australasia and South Africa. So that's the kind of the setting for what's happening nationally with music halls in the 1840s and 50s. An Inverness's music hall opened on Union Street in 1865. In context, that's only 10 years after the railway had come to Inverness. So you get this sense of the huge change occurring at, the, at that time. And as you'll all know, not long before the Education Act would happen and Franchise Act. So all sorts of um, changes happening in the area at that point. And Union Street is right in the centre of Inverness. For those who, who know the town, it's the street opposite the railway station. And the first edition ordinance survey maps show that the music hall was sited directly opposite the United Presbyterian Church and round the corner from St John's Episcopal. And you wonder um, how, that would have, uh, how that would have sat those things all together. The music hall when it was built could seat 1300, so substantial, 
Uh, in Inverness at that point had grown quite substantially, quite rapidly in the late 18th century, and the population of the town at that point was around about 12,000. So about 11% um, could be seated at any one time. And that really shows how much entertainment has changed, because um, I don't know about any of you, certainly when I had a quick look um, now, I think we would be around about 3 or 4% of the population of, of Inverness could be seated within the cinema at any one time. But it shows uh, the importance of that entertainment at the time. Because I would think, and maybe somebody um, else would be able to comment on this, but I would think up until that point, the only other buildings that would have that kind of capacity would be the churches. Um, Inverness Music Hall suffered a serious fire in 1898, and so it was subsequently renovated. And as you'll see as we go forward, there's some all sorts of stories of fire disrupting theatres and cinemas in the Highlands. But the building would go on to host the Royal National Mod in 1903 and 1912. And for those of you who are not familiar with the Mod, um, it was founded in 1891 to celebrate Gaelic uh, cultural heritage, so music, dance, uh, literature, language and so on. And it continues uh, to be hosted today. The Music Hall building was bought by the Methodist Church in 1922 and then remained their church until 1961 when it was again destroyed by fire. So I mentioned that uh, the Music Hall was built in 1865, but before that there was already a theatre in Inverness. The Theatre Royal started in around about 1805 um, in what was then called Theatre Lane, which is now Hamilton Street. And again, if anyone is familiar with Inverness, uh, it's the small street that goes alongside Marks and Spencers before uh, parallel with Ingalls Street, a, a narrow little lane. And that was called uh, Theatre Lane. And it was probably there that William Bailey had attended uh, the performances that he talks about in this uh, 1810 letter written to his brother Archie. Um, Archie was away attending at the East India College in Ware in Hertfordshire. Uh, and I'll read you the, the whole letter because it contains some interesting comment about what was entertainment in the early 19th century. So this is from our fantastic, wonderful Bailey of Denain collection, which I'm doing a talk on uh, later in the year. So, Budgate, 6th of March, 1810. My dear Archibald, I received your letter some little time ago and I'm happy to find that you continue to like Hartford. I need not tell you that we have little in the way of gaiety to entertain us at this dull season of the year. The only thing that can be said to savour of it is our Inverness Theatre, which is at present open. I've been to see several plays, but cannot say much in favour of the performers, although the novelty of the thing attracts pretty crowded audiences here. Among other amusements that we have lately fallen upon in this corner, horse racing has become a favourite one. On Friday last, I witnessed a race that took place in the neighbourhood of Fort George, betwixt a horse of Mr McGilvery's of Dunmaglass and one belonging to Major Hamilton of the 78th, each gentleman riding his own horse. The match was for a hundred guineas and the spectators, who were very numerous indeed, were in expectation of great sport. Their expectations, however, were balked, owing to Mr. Major Hamilton's horse giving up before it had run even one third of the course. Dunmaglass, of course, won the race without opposition. Tell me, do you ever find time to touch your flute now? Mr. Rose's clarinet and mine have been dumb for several months for want of a change of music, and are likely to continue so. Well, having given you all the little intelligence that this retired corner will afford me, I must conclude, believe me, dear Archibald, your affectionate brother, William Bailey. Uh, and if you think I'm being very casual by calling him Archie, he does get called Archie in other letters. I haven't taken that upon myself to name him that. Um, so the Theatre Royal. And I wanted to read a, a brief extract from the Inverness Courier uh, from, I think, 1822, um, which gives an, some idea of what went on in this theatre. So Theatre Royal Inverness, last night of performance. This evening, under the patronage of the Right Honourable Lady Saltoun, will be performed the fashionable comedy of Wives as They Were and Maids as They Are, and the musical farce of Age Tomorrow, with other entertainments. So there's uh, comedies, there's farces, there's uh, performances going on. But also, under the patronage of the Right, right Honourable Lady Anne Fraser and the Right Honourable Lady Saltoun, a grand masquerade and fancy ball will take place at the Theatre Royal Inverness on the close of the present season, Monday evening, June the 10th, 1822. On which occasion, the scenery will be wholly cleared away and the pit covered and attached to the stage to form the promenade. 
in bringing forward this novel entertainment which was recently patronised by the most brilliant and numerous audiences ever known in Aberdeen, Dundee and Perth. The manager begs leave to explain that it will be conducted on very different principles to the London masquerades. For instance, no lady or gentleman will be under restraint to wear either mask or domino unless it meets their approbation, but all will be at liberty, either to masquerade, to dance or to remain spectators of the varied and sprightly scenes of the evening, uh, joining and withdrawing from the entertainment, uh, from the amusement at their pleasure. The interior of the house will be decorated in a tasteful and novel manner, suited to the entertainment, with grand trophies, banners, Roman eagles, etc., shaded with laurels and other evergreens, orange trees in full bloom and the whole will be lighted with Chinese lanterns and the various uh, device among the various devices there will be a hermitage a grotto and an arbor refreshments will be plenteously provided and a full band of music will entertain it gives conjures up such a vivid picture I think of um, those orange trees and the Chinese lamps and the music and the costumes and the masks um, and it goes on to, to give the prices for attending and to say that if you don't have a costume you can hire a costume at the theatre uh, and gives all the details for that and that the final uh, sentence of the, of the ad advert says this entertainment cannot possibly be re repeated there's that, um, that thing of you must come because this is a one-off special in 1849, the Theatre Royal moved to Lowe's Rooms on Church Street, and there are numerous playbills from this period, 1849 to 1851, um, that appear on our website, Ambala. So do have a look. If you just type in theatre, you'll see them all coming up. And I wanted to read uh, at the start of one. One of them opens with this paragraph as the, the Theatre Royal moved from Theatre Lane to uh, Church Street. And it's written by the manager and Mr Glanville. As several years have elapsed since a theatre has been opened in Inverness, the manager feels bound to state to the public the policy of his management. The dramatic productions will be distinguished by novelty and combine tragedy, comedy, melodrama and farce. So just much like life. No piece of an immoral tendency will be presented and every objectionable word or phrase will be studiously admitted, uh, omitted so as to render the entertainment a source of intellectual recreation that the most fastidious cannot censure. The scenery and dresses are entirely new and the audience part of the theatre will be fitted up with every attention to the comfort of all parties. And then there's a later one which kind of gives an update on what's happened. Mr Glanville begs most respectfully to inform the ladies, gentlemen and inhabitants generally of Inverness and vicinity that the arrangements at the above named place of amusement are completed and the theatre is now at once commodious and comfortable. The gallery built by Mr Grant is so solid and substantial as to be capable of supporting any body of people with perfect security. The pit is compact and warm and the boxes, perfectly distant from all parts of the house, are enclosed by based partitions warmed by a large fire with seats completely covered. Everything has been done to ensure comfort and ease and the band led by Mr James Young has been pronounced excellent. And the playbills give some idea of what was on. So Macbeth, Hamlet and Othello sit alongside manager in distress, which you have to say like that because it has loads of exclamation marks after it. And the play, Did You Ever Send Your Wife to Dingwall? Which I'm intrigued if anybody knows what the script of that was. In 1881, Theatre Royal moved again uh, to Bank Street and it continued to host live performances until it was destroyed by fire in 1931 but its story would continue, which we will see uh, a little bit later on. Uh, I'm going to pause halfway through to remind you that this series is brought to you by High Life Island uh, at no cost to the viewer, that High Life Island is a charity registered in Scotland and that there's no payment or subscription required to take part in this series. Moving on to have a look at cinema, modern cinema started around about the 1890s um, and in the early days, travelling groups would take films to rural communities. And so, for example, in Caithness, um, Thurzo Town Hall and the Temperance Hall hosted films that were brought by Derwood Laley, uh, George W. Walker and other travelling groups. And then in the pre-war years, from the turn of the century to around about 1914, uh, cinemas began to find permanent homes, but in makeshift sites, so converted buildings um, or, or yeah, makeshift um, sites as opposed to in purpose-built sites. So, for example, in Wick, the skating rink had an agreement uh, with a Glasgow-based company to show regular films there. Um, 
this was this sort of setup was repeated across the country and so converted churches town halls temperance halls um, and places were used as cinemas sometimes for several weeks and sometimes for much longer and when you look just taking Caithness as an example when you look at that area alone in those years there are numerous companies and individuals trying to set up um, cinemas trying to establish themselves uh, trying to uh, negotiate contracts with film suppliers and so on and you get a real sense of the excitement being produced by this, the, this new and exciting cinema industry at this time. But it's in 1912-1913 that we really begin to see long-term homes for cinemas in the Highlands and I'm not going to mention them all so please if you know of others um, please do uh, type them into the comments and don't think that I'm meaning to ignore them. Um, but for example in Wick at this time Aubrey's new pavilion opened in the old skating rink and it was developed around about this time to include tip-up seats. There was an employed pianist to play along because of course these are silent films at this point. Um, in Thurso, John Sinclair Swanson, who was a very influential person in uh, the story of, of Thurso, also involved in forming the pipe band amongst other things, um, he opened the picture house in the temperance hall. And again these are sites that have been used um, on and off but they're now being adapted and being fitted out to be more permanent. So he altered the hall to include raised seating and a projection room. In Fort William at this time, uh, the cinema opened in the old town hall. And in Inverness in 1912 and 1913, uh, Central Hall Picture House and Kelso's La Scala Picture, uh, Picture Palace opened up both on Academy Street. If you're interested in uh, cinemas and, and theatres and the story of, of the development of that, um, I would really encourage you to have a look at the Academy Street Townscape Heritage website. It tells the story of the street through various buildings, through people's memories and so on. And there are sections there on many of the theatres and cinemas that I'm going to talk about. So I would encourage you to have a look at uh, the Townscape Heritage website. So of those two cinemas uh, in Inverness, La Scala was designed by, if you've watched uh, me for any length of time, you'll probably be able to make a guess at who designed La Scala. That was designed by Alexander Ross. Um, uh, his company and it seated over a thousand. It had an orchestra pit, a tea room uh, and one screen and as I said you really get a sense uh, in this of the excitement of the time and the, de the development of these places springing up um, the Central Hall Picture House as I said springing up at the same time. Now World War One of course slowed the development of new sites but what it did do was have a huge impact on audiences because people went to the cinema to watch newsreels and informative films about the progress of the war because of course this is well well before television was common in people's houses and the cinema as well as being a place of entertainment was a place of news and information and fact. As we come into the 1920s we start to turn towards purpose-built cinemas. On the 1st of November 1922 Provost Brims opened Caithness's first um, the first purpose-built cinema on St, uh, Sir George's Street, I keep going to say St George's, Sir George's Street in Thurso, run again by John Sinclair Swanson. It had a capacity of about 450 and was designed by Barbaritas Sinclair MacDonald, who I've mentioned several times. We hold a huge collection of Sinclair MacDonald uh, uh, plans and papers in our nucleus, Nuclear and Caithness archives. Mr Aubrey, who I mentioned uh, before, um, opened the new Pavilion Cinema in Ogg's Lane in Wick in 1924. That one was opened by Provost Green. The Playhouse in Fort William uh, was also on the move at this time to the High Street where it seated 678. And in Inverness, the Playhouse opened as a luxury theatre uh, in 1929 and it was one of the first cinemas to be specifically designed for films with sound, which is amazing. It had boxes, uh, so it looked very much like a theatre and it had a cafe and it will be a place I'm sure if any of you are local that you'll have memories of. And it would go on to host other important events at the Playhouse in Inverness, such as Freedom of the Borough ceremonies. So Edward Prince of Wales' ceremony was held there in 1931 and Queen Elizabeth the Queen Mother's Freedom of Inverness ceremony was held there in 1953. So central to the community. Now you may remember I spoke a little while ago about the Theatre Royal and the fact that it was destroyed with fire in 1931, having been in the town since about 1805 and I said I would come back to the legacy uh, of that theatre. Now after that fire in 1931, the Central Picture House 
which I mentioned opened uh, in 1912-1913, uh, 1913, started hosting the live shows that would have been in the Theatre Royal if it hadn't burnt down. And then in 1934, it was completely designed by, of course, uh, Alexander Ross's um, architect's firm to better enable the, what had been built as a cinema to host theatre performances. So the stage was enlarged, the dressing rooms were added and it was rebranded as the Empire Theatre on Academy Street, which many of you, I'm sure, will remember. A very, very striking building and, and a loss to the landscape of Academy Street, I, I think. In its first week in 1934, it hosted uh, Sir Harry Lauder as mu and as well as various other uh, sorts of performances and, and so on. Now, these theatres and cinemas that I've mentioned remained largely in operation for the next few decades. Um, there were some changes of names and ownership. There were some refurbishments and extensions. There were some fires, of course. Um, and we hold... Uh, within our archive collections, we hold tickets, we hold programmes, playbills, uh, images and so on of these theatres and cinemas. There were also various others across the Highlands, and as I said, I certainly won't be able to touch on all of them, but um, there was a playhouse in Invergordon, which was a, had a 500-seat uh, cinema. There was a playhouse in Granton, which was destroyed by fire in the 1950s. Um, and Inverness Arts Guild um, had set up the Little Theatre in Faraline Park, which, again, some of you may remember... And films continued to be shown in rural communities as well by travelling operators, so much as they had been done um, from the early days. And I wanted to read you an extract from a booklet that we hold in Inverness in the Archive Centre, which looks, it's a study into leisure pursuits in, across the Highlands and Islands, and it's from 1968. Very, very interesting. It's a, I won't read it all because it's a sort of 40 page booklet, but very interesting to see their summary of what leisure activities were happening, what people were doing in their spare time, and still the huge, huge influence of the church on what was considered acceptable. So it reads, most isolated communities are able to see films either weekly, fortnightly, or monthly. The shows, both in the town-linked and isolated villages, are provided sometimes by private operators, but mainly by the Highlands and Islands Film Guild. The aim of this organisation, which exhibits 16mm films over a wide area of the Highlands, is to improve the educational, cultural and recreational amenities available to rural communities in the Highlands and Islands. It also attempts to assist education authorities in furthering the educational use of films in rural schools and communities, and to produce or encourage the production of films which may become permanent records of Scottish life. The Guild operates on a non-profit making basis and receives assistance from the Scottish Education Department, local education authorities and other bodies and communities throughout the Highlands and Islands. While welcoming this assistance, the Guild hopes to become in the not too distant future financially independent. This hope, however, has been rather diminished by the advent of television. In the annual report for 1958, it was stated that in four areas of the Highlands, Argyll, Rossshire, Invernessshire and Sutherland, Television was affecting attendances at, and therefore income from, Film Guild showings. The report for 1959 was more optimistic and stated that the audience decline due to the immediate effect of television may be halted. Nevertheless, television services are once more about to be extended. In Argyll and Invernessshire, the BBC and ITV hope to cover the whole of Scotland by 1963 so that another decline in audiences may be expected. To meet this threat of declining audiences, the Guild is planning to reorganise its activities. Some services will be restricted and others withdrawn. Changes, say the report, seem unavoidable in the most unremunerative unre areas. So that feeling there of the changing entertainment, so the, the music hall coming and going and then the theatres coming and not going, but um, the cinemas coming and then changing as... Um, as television comes in. And of course at this time in the in the 60s, 70s, 80s there are also numerous uh, amateur dramatic societies uh, operating. We hold papers of, of various of these, the Black Isle Players and, and different ones. Um, and the letters from this time show the huge importance of cinema and drama and theatre uh, to people. There's one collection where almost every letter that the lady, when she writes her letter to her family member and she finishes it with P.S. This is what's at the cinema this week. And it's always in there as a huge um, piece of news. So the 
there's some changes within there, some change uh, in audience and market and so on. But it's really the 70s and 80s that we see the next big flurry of changes and they're not all good. Um, so the Playhouse in Fort William, which had gone from being a cinema to being a bingo hall, was demolished in 1979. The Playhouse in Inverness was destroyed by fire in 1972. The Empire Theatre, which had started as the Central Hall Picture House and then taken on the mantle of the Theatre Royal, was demolished in 1971, not long after it had hosted a concert from T-Rex, who were not yet well known. And it was a, a, chain, a big period of change across the Highlands, and you can see there some of the big names I've mentioned of venues all closing or burning down or being demolished in the same period. But there was good news uh, coming. In 1976, Eden Court Theatre opened in Inverness. Eden Court Theatre is named after Bishop Robert Eden, uh, and the building was designed by Law Dunbar Naismith Architects. A new state-of-the-art building, purpose-built, um, fabulous uh, hexagonal shaped building which incorporated the gothic style bishop's palace of alexander ross um purpose-built theater with restaurant art gallery uh, and so on and eden court has gone through several uh, refurbishments since that building in 1978 but it remains uh, a grade a listed building and it now hosts two theaters uh, a cinema a restaurant a gallery the main theatre is called the Empire Theatre, which is named after the Empire Theatre uh, on Academy Street as a tribute to that building. The cinema is called La Scala Cinema, a tribute to the Inverness cinema of that name, which, after it hosted the world premiere of Loch Ness, the Ted Danson film in 1996, uh, finally closed in 2001 and was demolished in 2005, reputedly the longest serving cinema in Scotland when it closed. So it's lovely um, that Eden Court has kept those names and those tributes of those uh, the buildings and the, the organisations that have gone before. And Eden Court is now Scotland's largest combined arts organisation. It has, as I mentioned, a, a, a gallery, theatres, cinemas, but it also runs a huge outreach programme across the Highlands and interacts with the thousands of uh, communities and school groups right across the Highlands and I remember benefiting from that as a child. I, I came up um, to see the ballet and we did a, a workshop with the dancers and we came to see the pantomime and things like that. So we have uh, Eden Court in Inverness now, we also have a view cinema uh, in Caithness. The cinema is now provided by the Merlin Cinemas in Thurso. In Fort William, a brand new venture uh, has just opened the Highland Cinema, which is providing um, that kind of theatre, cinema, big screen experience for uh, Loch Aber in the present day, and it's a beautiful uh, building. And there are other similar projects like that being run across the Highlands. So com uh, Cromarty Community Cinema in the back, Black Isle, Spey Valley Cinema in Abbeymore, Aros Cinema in Skye. Um, and not to mention the very many active theatre groups, amateur dramatic groups, choral societies uh, and theatres still operating across the Highlands, such as the Mill Theatre, Lythe Arts, uh, the Florians uh, in Inverness and various others. So, um, yes, and Fiona, the screen machine, we love the screen machine, um, that goes continues that tradition of taking films to people rather than um, vice versa. And of course, we all know that films have a, um, a huge power to... Um, to enable people to reminisce as well and some I'm sure will know about um, uh, the Screen Memories project which is a project using archive material to do with uh, films and cinema and that cinema experience uh, to work with people living with dementia and them remember um, those experiences of getting dressed up and going out to the cinema. So although it's changed and although we've come from the Theatre Royal through the Music Hall and so on we still have that connection in the Highlands um, Kirsten, I'm seeing your comment about Campbellton Cinema. It's um, out with my area of knowledge, I'm afraid, but I will absolutely trust your knowledge on it. Um, thank you for uh, joining me this week. I hope you've enjoyed uh, learning a little bit about cinemas and theatres and, and some of those changes that have happened. As I say, I certainly couldn't mention them all. I hope you can join me next week. Next week, I'll be looking at stories of holidays in our collections. It will be pre-recorded because I will actually be on holiday. Um, but it's been really fun writing and researching that one, finding all sorts of um, comments. And I hope, Elizabeth, you can watch that one because there's some fabulous diaries from New Zealand uh, in it. 
So thank you for joining me and uh, a reminder that this series is brought to you by High Life Island at no cost to the viewer. That High Life Island is a charity registered in Scotland and there's no payment or subscription required to take part in this series. But if you are able to donate towards our work, then we're really very grateful for that and it enables us to carry on researching and carry on sharing our collections with you. So thank you for joining me.